Om Aganati Marandasya Ganangana Sarakaya Chaksurun Militam Yanatashmai Sri Gurave Nama Sri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Shapitam Yanabhutare Sayam Rupa Karameyam Darati Svaparantikam Vandeham Sri Guru Siyata Parakamanam Sri Gurun Vaishnavam Sya Sri Rupam Sagaritam Sahagana Raganatam Vitam Stam Sadevam Sadvaitam Subhadutam Parijana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Paran <coughs> Sahagana Larita Sri Vishakan Vitam Vishtam He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dinu Bandhu Jagapate Gopisha Gopika Kanta Radhakanta Namostate Chayatam Surato Pango Mama Manera Matergati Matsavasha Param Boja Radha Namaja Namona Sri Man Rasa Rasa Rambi Vamsi Vada Karsan Penarishan Upago Gopinata Sri Asaram Divya Advindarani Kapadu Mada Shri Madhuratna Gada Shri Mishanishto Shri Shri Radha Shri Govinda Prasada Vihi Seva Manush Marami Namo Brahmanya Devaya Go Brahmani Taya Cha Jagadi Taya Krishnaya Govindaya Namo Nama Mangalang Bhagavan Vishnu Mangaram Guru Rajaja Mangaram Padiyak Kaksho Mangaraya Tano Hari Om Naraya Naya Vidmahi Vasudevaya Dimahi Tano Vishnu Pachodya Tehe O Mahadevi Chabidmihi Vishnu Padni Chadimihi Tano Lakshmi Pachodya Tehe Mahalakshmi Namastibyam Namastibyam Sare Sare Hari Priya Namastibyam Namastibya Naya Dege Taptikan Janago Ringi Rade Vindavane Shari Vishavana Sute Devi Pranamani Hari Priya Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pastaya Bhutare Shemari Bhakti Padanta Shami Dinamana Mishte Sari Sati Devi Guramani Pachari Ne Nir Vishesh Sunivari Prasketa De Satari Ne Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Giradhar Shiva Sri Gaur Bhakta Vrindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare As you may recall, I have this desk donated by Manoj and Divya Narayan that goes up and down. So I just adjusting the height so that I can look on a on a flat plane to the little light there which represents the camera. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us, Guru Krishna Das, John Malik, Brent, Vai Bobby, Rob on Zoom here. We're starting to get uh, members trickling back to Utah from the Kartik period in India. Many of the Radhanath disciples like Kruti Nagaraj, Sundari Priya, and Govinda Dev went to the Yatra in Puri with Radhanath Swami and Jagannath Puri. I see Govinda Dev is back. Kruti Nagaraj gave the Bhagavatam class, I think, last Saturday. That was the first for her. And I'll bet she did a great job. And uh, <clears throat> I haven't heard anything about Sundari Priya being back, but it should be imminent as well. Thanks for joining us, Shali. Last uh, session, Wisdom Wednesday from last week, we ended with the analogy uh, that the crocodile's teeth one set of teeth is very sharp and the other set of teeth is dull. So whether it's happiness, so-called happiness or distress in this material world, they're both, we're in both cases, we're in the teeth of the crocodile. What we call as happiness really means it's just distress, but not quite so sharp, not quite so tearing. You know, when we feel the distresses of this material world in a more blunt way, so it's not tearing and cutting, lesions and blood and gore we say we're happy and then we when when it's um when it's very graphic then we say we're sad just like perfect example in the middle east now <clears throat> it things have things have erupted in such a way that it is totally totally ghastly the the bombing the number of people that are killed in the bombings the the atrocities the massacre the subhuman attacks on October 7th it's it these are this if there's any doubt in your mind these are the sharp teeth of the crocodile these are the sharp teeth of the crocodile the lulls between all the various wars and conflicts that have occurred in the Middle East since 1948 and there have been quite a few it's just alternating between the sharp teeth of the crocodile and the dull teeth of the crocodile the dull creek of the crocodile means there's not so much blood, there's not so much gore, the, the dark side, the barbaric side of human, human personality is not evident at the moment, but it's there, it's lurking. 
dayato visham krodha bhavati samaha samaha shmuti bhamshat buddhina sho buddhina sho pranashati. From be, contemplating the object of the senses, one develops attachment. From attachment, lust arises. From lust, anger. And when one becomes anger, there's the bewilderment of memory. Krodha bhavati samatya, krodha bhavati samaha. When one gets angry, one loses all vestiges, all pretense of civilized behavior, civilized comportment. So the laws, the peace years, were like the blunt teeth of the crocodile and the, the years in which war flared up was a sharp teeth. And also you'll notice it's ratcheted up. It gets progressively, progressively more ghastly. It, the October 7th massacre is likened to the biggest massacre since the Holocaust itself. Um, and haven't we also become, because things ratchet up, because each time the cycle repeats itself, the sharp teeth of the crocodile manifest themselves in an even more ghastly, barbaric, subhuman way, we ourselves become desensitized. Things that shocked 20, 30 years ago are not so shocking nowadays. I gave you the example during the Sunday feast last night that the Secretary General of the United Nations was asked to condemn the October 7th attacks. And he he deflected the question by saying, you don't understand the context. <laughs> you don't understand the context. Now I ask you, what context could justify um, entering into people's homes killing the father, killing the mother, raping, <clears throat> beheading the children. You don't understand the context. Like if we understood the provocation of context, then it would be okay. Hello. And this is the, this is the United, the secretary general of the United Nations, no less. So as the sharp <coughs> the teeth of the crocodile become more and more in evidence, our sensitivity, our threshold for horrible graphic circumstances, happenstances become, the threshold becomes lowered and lowered and lowered. Now, going back to our story here, <laughs> we've mentioned several times that the fight between the elephant and the crocodile lasted a thousand years by the calculation of the demigods. But actually, the fight between the jiva, the individual spirit soul, and maya has been going on perhaps for millions and millions and millions of years. Keshaga satika bhaya panashikana jara shamara jiva rishurupa vichari. The tiny spirit spark that rests within the heart of the living being, um, one ten thousandth the size of a tip of a hair. He's, he and I, you and I, we are the same quality as God, just like particles of sunshine possess light and heat, just in the same way that the sun globe itself possesses light and heat. But the difference is a quantitative difference. A particle of sunshine can become covered by clouds. The sun globe itself can never be covered by clouds. So although we're quantitatively, qualitatively one with the Lord, because there's a quantitative difference, we can become affected by the material energy. We can become covered by maya, whereas the Lord cannot. When the Lord comes, his descent is ascribed in the Bhagavad Gita. When the Lord comes down from the spiritual world, he does not have to assume a material body in order to appear within this material atmosphere. The material energy is his his energy, it's his subordinate energy. He never becomes subject to the limitations of this material energy. Therefore, it is said, a jopishan of yayatma, his unborn, his eternal, his impalished, Im infallible, imperishable body, he, he descends in that self-same spiritual form, which is the transcendental autocrat of the spiritual world. But foolish men who haven't got the information from the right source. They think they miss the fact that that same Krishna who appeared at a certain time, stayed a certain 
His, his sojourn in this material world was about 130 years. It happened 5,300 years ago. He appeared in uh, what's present day Matura, traveled from Matura to Dorka and back and forth and so on and so forth. It, it escapes them that this historical personality is at one and the same time Bhuta Bhava, the Lord of all creatures. Having descended, not being forced to do so, not being subjugated or, or conditioned or subordinated by the effect of the material nature, rather appearing within his self-same spiritual form for the purpose of revealing himself in his spiritual world and attracting us back to home, back to God. So this fight has been going on for millions of years. There's the jiva who is encased, entrenched, encapsulated in this material tabernacle um, and as long as he looks down to matter as long as he relies upon himself to solve the innumerable insoluble problems in this material world and by the same token as long as he looks to others politicians celebrities military leaders demigods like lord shiva and lord brahma as long as he looks to others to solve as long as he looks to other materially conditioned souls to solve what is essentially a spiritual problem, the only result is that your valuable time is going to be wasted. Literally, we have wasted millions of years, millions of lifetimes in this material world by failing to look up to the Lord, rather yielding to our habit of looking down at our problems and looking around. Like Gajendra, when he was grabbed by the crocodile, first he looked down at the crocodile. He looked at the problem. He looked at his leg. He looked at the blood. He looked at the gore. He looked at the water. Then he looked around to see what elephants, male, female elephants, might possibly be able to help him. He did not get the sucker, the help the assistance that he needed by looking down. Neither did he get it by looking around on a horizontal plane. That's a good analogy for us. For who knows how many millions of years, thousands of lifetimes, we have looked down at the problem and around for the solution to the problem. The problem is that those who are materially conditioned, even up to Lord Brahma himself, cannot give us a solution to what is essentially a spiritual problem. Those who are themselves meant for death cannot solve your death problem. We're all aware that Harani after doing austerities for 120 years by the calculation of demigods, after which Lord Brahma, the creator of the universe, appeared before him, and most people in the Western countries, if you ask them who God is, they'll say, he's the creator. God is that person who created. Well, Brahma is the creator, but let's hear what he said. Rani Kashipu asked for the boon of immortality. And Brahma immediately answered, I can't give you what I don't have. Now, here's the creator of this particular universe, and he himself will come to his inevitable end after granted billions and trillions of years, but that time will come when Lord Brahma himself will have to leave his body. So how can he help Hiranyakashipu? How can he prevent or assist Hiranyakashipu in not having to leave his body? One cannot give what one does not have. So as long as we look to this material world for a solution to a material spiritual problem, we'll, we'll not only be frustrated, but we'll also lose a lot of time. Einstein, the great thinker of the modern age, he said famously, the consciousness in which the problem was created cannot be the consciousness in which it is solved. The solution to our repetition of birth, death, disease, and old age in this material world is not to look at matter and nor to look to those who are themselves conditioned by matter to themselves who themselves are going to die, but the solution is to look beyond matter. It's often said in the Bible, man should not go by sight alone, but he should go by what he knows. 
So we can't see Krishna with these material eyes, but with the awakening of transcendental knowledge by the grace of the spiritual master, we can come to know that there is Krishna's hand in every situation and look through the situation and look be above the situation for the help of the Lord. And when we do that, all mucking around in this material world, all time wasting comes to an abrupt screeching halt. In the third Cant of the Bhagavatam, it says, Bhuta Bhokta Parijaga Drishta Deshanishnesharasharam Shwamihimi Stitashita. Mahimi means glorious. Shtitasha means situated. The living entity becomes glorious. Shwamihimi Stitashita. Bhuta Boga Parijaga. Bhuta Boga. This means that we want to, we rely upon material nature for our pleasure. We rely on material nature for the solution to the problems which have been caused by our association with material nature in the first place. Saita, what is that verse? Saita karmaku kukuru. Um, materialistic people who have been given some intelligence by God are very proud of the fact that as soon as a problem arises, due to our exploitation of material nature, as soon as there's an inevitable reaction to that, we figure out some way of supposedly counteracting it. But the problem is that in due course of time, it becomes evident that that um, invention, that so-called innovation, which was meant to counteract a material problem, ends up becoming more problematic than the problem itself. We should have just learned to tolerate things. We should have thus recognized that this material world is not created for our comfort. It's not created for our convenience. No matter how clever or inventive we are, no matter how many new technologies we create or new medical procedures, the, 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 the frustration and the miseries of material nature are not going to go away at any time soon. So one must look to the solution to these material unending and continually increasing problems with a spiritual solution. That's the, that's the, that's the point. Therefore, Bhuta Boga Parityaga, you have to come to the point of not reflexively looking to matter, not looking to materially conditioned souls for the solution of spiritual problems. And when you do that, when you're disillusioned, and that's a good thing, devotees of the Lord try to become disillusioned. They try not to put their hopes in dull, dead matter. They try not to put their hopes uh, on those who themselves are already within the jaws of the black snake called death but they put their hopes in the Lord. Bhukta boga purikya, drishta dosha to nishisha. Drishta dosha means everywhere they look in this material world, they see it's broken. The material world is broken. The elements of the material world are broken. The inhabitants of this material world are broken. The leaders, the politicians are broken. The militarists are broken. The demigods are broken. Drishta doha, nisha, neshvarashadum, the only way to become glorious, the only way to step into your own glory, your own luminosity, is to give up any pretense of leaning on this material world with all of its solutions, with all of its so-called solutions, and see the hand of the Lord behind everything. Do what Gajender did, look up to the Lord. He plucked a lotus flower from the muck of the lake with his trunk and offered to the Lord his hopes turn to the Lord uh, who awards protection to his devotees. And when Gajendra plucked the lotus flower and offered it up to the Lord, that's the point at which his, his sojourn in this material world was coming to an end. This verse in the eighth chapter of the 30s this 32nd verse of the 8th chapter of the 8th canto. 32nd verse of the 2nd chapter of the 8th canto of the Bhagavatam 
it says that Gajendra came to the full, complete, unequivocal, unambiguous, stark realization that he was alone. Namami me ataram gaja kuta karina. Even though he was he he was powerful, his body was like a mountain. He was the king of the elephants. He was blessed. He was favored. He was an inhabitant of the heavenly planets. He was surrounded by many female elephants. And normally the bull elephants who've been defeated by one bull elephant, they're envious. They like to see the demise of their, their rival. So then they can step in and then maybe themselves become the lord of the herd. But apparently Gajendra had not only subordinated the other bull, bull elephants, but he'd done it without incurring their enmity. They also looked to him to be the king. They recognized that Gajendra is the best king, the best leader. We don't think we can fill his shoes. And so if they could have, they would have assisted Gajendra to extract himself from the jaws of the crocodile. But none of them wanted to go into the water of the material world. They had a healthy fear of the water. In fact, that's how Gajendra got himself caught in the first place, because he was number one, the head honcho. He, he had lost his fear of the water. He had failed to calculate that once he goes into the water, he puts himself at a disadvantage. In his pride, and in his intoxicated state of mind, he thought that as I am now, I will always be, I will always be sovereign. Uh, because so many years have elapsed and no, no serious challenge has confronted me. This is the way it's going to be indefinitely moving forward. And that overconfidence, that arrogance is a crucial miscalculation, which often comes before a fall of reversal. The fact is that if we're experiencing uh, good results, if everything's going our way, if all of our challengers have given up and, and conceded defeat to us, we should be very wary. We should be very cautious because the nature of this material world is going to be one crisis after another. So if you, if you, for the moment, got your crisis solved, got your enemies, enemies pacified, you've got problems, recent problems behind you, you've gotten through them, there is a period, there has been a period of calm sailing, a period of tranquility, a period where everything you do turns to gold, then you should be worried. You should be worried because after the lull comes the storm. And if you're in a period where nothing is going your way, you have people wanting to stab you on your back, you have politics at the office, you have that child that won't listen to you, you can actually be happy. You can actually be happy because you're getting rid of some past bad karma. Just tolerate it. Don't try to counteract it. Just go with the flow and let it run its course. Let it run its course. Tashaiva preta kobido verana nalabyate yadu karimara talabyate dukavaran yada kalena sarvata gapira ramasha. It says, don't try for happiness any more than you try for distress. Without trying for it, distress automatically comes. No one prays for it. Uh, no one wants it. And yet distress comes over and over and over again. So in the same way that distress comes without our praying for it, happiness will come in the same way. If you're in the middle of a challenge, if you're in the middle of a valley in your life, uh, if things are not going your way, don't try to solve the problem by complicating things with another material solution. Don't look to another conditioned soul to relieve you of your trouble. Just tolerate it. Recognize that this is for your purification. This is to mature you. This is to toughen you up. Recognize that Difficult problems, reverses, and challenges are the Lord's way of preparing us, of broadening our shoulders, building our muscles up so that down the road, we will be able to shoulder the burdens of the blessings that he has in mind. Thank the Lord for sending those difficulties, because were it not for those difficulties, 
you would not be the kind of person that the Lord could put blessings on your shoulder and count on you in order to uh, exercise the responsibility of those blessings in such a way as to please him. <clears throat> Consider the case of Aranyakashipu. Aranyakashipu must have had some piety um, spilling over from his last life. And in his current life, as described in the seventh canto of Bhagavatam, he did penances and austerities for 125 years to the point where an ant hill developed around his um, still passive, non-moving body. The ants ate all the flesh off of his body. And yet his yogi power was so formidable that he circulated his life air within the skeleton of his body. And finally, Lord Brahma felt obliged to appear before him and to give him whatever boon he wanted. As a result of the boons that Lord Brahma gave, he became invulnerable during the day and the night. He, nobody could kill him on the land or the air or the sea. Nobody could kill him uh, in the house or outside of the house. No man or beast could kill him. No weapon could kill him. He thought he was immortal and he went on to dominate the whole universe. Hiranyakashipu went so far as to sit on the throne of Indra, the king of heaven. And he said to his son, He said to his five-year-old son, remember, Prahlad is just a little boy. He has no army. He has no influence. He has no allies. He has no one in the palace speaking up for him. He has no weapons. He's uh, he's all alone, a five-year-old boy in a dynasty of demons <clears throat> headed up by his father. And there was no opposition anywhere within the universe. It, it, as it is stated by Hiranyakashivu, Krodashya Yasakambate, when Hiranyakashivu was in a bad mood, Krodashya Yasakambate, Treya Lokasya, the whole world trembled. Uh-oh. The demigods, Indra, Chandra, Vayu, Kavera, they're all like, uh-oh, Hiranyakashipu's in a bad mood today. We better keep our heads down. We better keep away from him. Even Narada Muni, when he would come to visit Hiranyakashipu, he would sing the glories of Hiranyakashipu. Hiranyakashipu was controlling the weather. He was controlling the seasonal changes. He was controlling the rain. He was controlling the sunshine. He, he usurped not only Indra's throne, but he was exercising all the powers of Indra, the king of the heavenly planets. And he says to his five-year-old son, who are you to talk back to me? Who are you? Who are your friends? What are your resources? What are your powers? I, I am so powerful that when I'm in a bad mood, when, when my eyebrow cocks itself, when I, when I simply raise an eyebrow at somebody, they tremble in fear. They become undone. They become babbling idiots in my presence. When my eyebrow lifts a millimeter and my air, uh, eyes become red, the whole Treya Lokasha, everybody is struck in fear of me and the whole three worlds tremble. Who do you think you are now this Ranikashipu was obviously the son and the father were living in the same palace. The palace had previously been inhabited by Indra. And this Ranikashipu was spending 24 hours a day. This man who had conquered the universe, who had hordes of armies, who had mystic powers. Uh, in in fear of whom the demigods themselves would tremble when he raised his eyebrow. This malicious, threatening, envious personality was spending 24 hours a day trying to figure out how to kill his five-year-old son. And they were both living in the house. It was Sarani Kajibu's house. Prahlad was living in the house. Can you imagine the potential stress that Prahlad could have been under, living in a house as the dependent of the, of the owner who is trying to kill you. How could you sleep at night? 
knowing that your father is plotting to kill you through poison, through snakes, through piercing your body with javelins and pitchforks, through boiling you in oil, through throwing you off of a cliff, through putting you under the feet of a war elephant. And how can anyone live under those conditions? I talked to Larry and Natasha. They've taken uh, their sister's children. Uh, they've assumed the role of foster parents from their sister's children who, who had previously lived in Florida. And the, the, the sister and her husband moved out and they tried getting a job and go, getting sober. I'm not sure how that worked out. But Natasha and Larry took the five kids into their home in Cedar Hills. And last I talked to them, I don't know, are you listening today? Nat yeah, Natasha's here. Natasha's here. Natasha's got some poetry. But if you're listening, I'm just going to share this story with your permission, Natasha, if you, if you allow me. So we were talking and uh, Natasha and Larry said that now, obviously, these kids have not grown up in a very wholesome environment. The parents are addicts and um, trying to get clean and un unfit parents. And so out of the kindness of their hearts, Natasha and Larry stepped in and they're uh, raising these five children as well as one or two of their own. And uh, she, they said the four kids are doing good. Four kids are, are really coming along. Um, flourishing under the love and care and concern and advice of Larry and Natasha. But there's one kid, he's only four years old, and he's getting worse. He seemed to have gotten better for a while. Example is he was toilet trained. He was going to the toilet on his own, which seemed to be an improvement over the one he was. But then at some point, he just decided to backtrack. He decided to turn right around, throw it all in the faces of his well-wishers, and he, he gave up his potty trainer. He goes anywhere and everywhere. He stinks up the place. It's disgusting. It's ghastly. But they put up with it until such time as the four-year-old threatened them that at night he threatened that I may come in and do something to you. I may make you dead some night. So this couple who took these five kids in out of the kindness of their heart and four of them, they're giving a new lease on life. They're actually instrumental in turning the kid's life around, bringing them up from the uh, circumstances in which they're in and giving them a whole new lease on life. But this one kid, this one kid, not only will he not uh, bask, take advantage of the love and the concern and the help and the wholesomeness of this household. But he goes to so far as to cause them to lock their door at night when they go to sleep. And that was the last straw. Nat Natasha asked me, I hope you don't mind me sharing this. Should we send them back to Florida? And I said, I think you've done everything that you could possibly do. You know, you, you, you can't, we can't make people change. We can pray for them. We can give them the right circumstances, the right environment. We can let them know we love them. But if they throw all that back in our face, and the last straw is, if you can't sleep safely and peacefully in your own home at night, if you have to lock your door, that person has to go. So this is the situation of Prahlad. How can Prahlad this isn't a case of Prahlad threatening his father. It's just the opposite. Nirvari apashanti ashashud pravini dinishe pi varodhyana. Nirvari apashantaya shashuta mahatmaya. Hiranyakashivu was told, he was warned, shashuta mahatmaya. Your, your son is not a smart aleck. He's not a miscreant. Uh, he's not disturbed. He's not at risk. Nevariya Pashantya, he is deeply peaceful. He's like an ocean of calm and tranquility. Even in the midst of your persecutions, even though he's cohabiting a house in which you're plotting to kill him by multiple means, he is still peaceful. He is calm. Nevariya Pashantya, Shashuta Mahapna. Why? Because your son is not an ordinary child. He is a Mahatma. He is fixed in service at the lotus feet of Krishna. 
Nivari Apashanti Ashashara, Hrada Dinishere, Dinishe Pi Varoditam. And if and at that point at which you go too far, there will be a point, Hiranyakashipu is warned, that when you go too far, the Lord knows what Prahlad is going through. The Lord knows what Prahlad is put up with. And the Lord has protected him in drowning, in poisoning, among snakes. The Lord will continue not only to protect him, but when Hiranyakashipu finally takes it too far, there will be a a line in the sand after which Hiranyakashipu crosses, the Lord says, enough. That's enough. It's payback time. And we all know that time comes when Hiranyakashipu smashes his sword into the pillar and the Lord emerges from that pillar as a half man, half lion incarnation. Fulfills all the conditions that Lord Brahma gave. Didn't kill him the day or the night, killed him at twilight, didn't kill him on the land or the air or the sea, but he put him on his lap and he killed him there. He didn't kill him inside the house or outside of the house. He killed him on the porch. No man or beast killed Hiranyakashipu, but it was a half man, half beast, lion incarnation of Lord. And Hiranyakashipu was not killed by any weapon, but he's killed by the fingernails of the Lord. The Lord personally intervened. He didn't send, he didn't, he could have given Hiranyakashipu a heart attack. Uh, he could have uh, sent a demigod. Uh, there are any number of ways the Lord could have protected Prahlad Maharaj and dispatched Hiranyakashipu. But the Lord is attracted by the consciousness of a devotee. Uh, the Lord doesn't even have control over himself. When there's someone who looks to the Lord, given up all pretense of seeking protection from material nature or from other materialistically conditioned souls, one who has become disillusioned with trying to solve material problems of birth, death, disease, and old age with material solutions, realizes that each one of us is alone in this material world. We have a problem and we have to deal with it by ourselves, not by looking to anything material, not by looking down, not by looking around, but by looking up. And in all of that, when he was drinking the poison, when the snakes were surrounding, when the demons were trying to pierce his body with weapons, when he was in boiling oil, you look at all the pictures and Prahlad has got his pranams, he's got Anjali Mudra, folded hands, and he's looking up. He's not looking at the oil. He's not looking at the snakes. He's not looking at the demons. He's not looking at the elephant thinking, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? What am I gonna, who's going to come to save me? No, he's not even registering any of that. He's simply seeing that behind all of these challenges, all of these enemies, there is the hand of the Lord. And nowhere, the seventh canto of the Bhagavatam, throughout all the litany of tortures that the father inflicted on the son, abuses, talk about child abuse. This is the worst case of child abuse in the history of the world. You'll not find a single verse in which Prahlad expresses fear, a single verse in which Prahlad complains, a single verse in which Prahlad expresses anger, wants to get back at his father, a single verse in which Prahlad wants retaliation, a single verse where Prahlad doubts that Krishna will protect him. And when Sringadev when came, and I'm sure there were many points, the demigods were vitally concerned about this pastime because they wanted to get their physicians back. And they realized that Prahlad is the fulcrum, Prahlad is the leverage by which Hiranyakashipu will be killed. It's described that Prahlad was born like a ironwood in the, in the forest of the demons. Uh, you know, forests are chop, chopped down with an axe. And Vishnu was the axe who was going to chop down the whole race of the demons. But an axe cannot function without an axe handle. And the axe handle must be very hard because if you hit hardwood 
and you don't have an even harder wood comprising the handle, the axe, the, the handle will break. So Vishnu is the axe and Prahlad is the hardwood tree appearing within the forest of the demons. The Prahlad will be the handle, Vishnu will be the axe by which the whole demoniac race will be destroyed. So the demigods were sitting on the edge of their seats and they're thinking, why hasn't the Lord come by now? Why has the Lord come by now? Throwing Prahlad off a cliff. How can the Lord allow that to happen? Putting Prahlad in oil. How can the Lord allow that happen? The Lord's supposed to protect. I'm sure that the point had come and gone where the faith of the demigods, which is, you know, above average. One wouldn't be a demigod unless one had above average faith in the Lord. But I'm sure that in all of this, one persecution, one abuse after another, one attempt at murder after another, I'm sure that every single demigod had come to the end, to the limits of their faith, and began to doubt the Lord's ability to protect, to intervene on Prahlad's behalf. Even though each attempt was unsuccessful, still, and that should have given them a clue, but still, they thought sooner or later, Prahlad's going to, um, Hiranyakashi was going to get lucky. If he tries enough means of killing his son, sooner or later, one of them's going to work. I'm sure every demigod had come to that point where they'd run out of faith. Their faith is exhausted. They started to doubt. They started to be afraid that Prahlad would not be, after all, the means of the destruction of the demonic race. And ultimately, Deva Shartika Nasarava, they were concerned about their own position. They wanted to get their own positions back. So their worship of the Lord and their monitoring of Prahlad's situation was not exactly selfless. They had their own agenda. So when all of the demigods, none of whom was being tortured like Prahlad Maharaj, none of whom was living in the same house with someone who wanted to kill them. When all of them were afraid, when all of them had started to doubt, when all of them were beginning to complain, when all of them were wondering when is when or if or is the Lord going to come, Prahlad never faltered. Prahlad never stumbled. Getting to the end of the time here, but one verse comes to mind from the ninth canto. It says that when you put all your faith in the Lord, you retract your faith in other conditioned souls and in this material nature, and in the vaccines, and in the in the in the the weapons and the counter weapons and the words and the counter words, and you give up all pretense of being able to counteract. <clears throat> the material condition life with anything material it said that uh, it said that uh, um, you can run you can run you can run blindfolded you can run blindfolded and not stumble if, if even even if you're blind and we are blind we're in this material world it's it's dark it's basically a dark place we, the only illumination is the artificial sun. But we're actually, I, I was born in the darkest of ignorance. I was born in the dark material world. So in effect, we're all blinded. But if we um, are undividedly faithful and trusting of the Lord, the verse goes so far as to say, is that not only can you walk in the darkness without stumbling, but you can run with the Lord within your heart. Taking advantage, not of your own limited material eyes, but putting yourself in the hands of the Lord and letting him be your beacon, letting him go before you and remove the obstacles, make the crooked places straight, fight your battles. It is said that you can run blindfolded. You can run blindfolded. But what's the secret? What's the secret? Here's the example. A faithful dog can sniff the master. A faithful dog can recognize the master no matter 
what attire the master appears in. No matter how the master is dressed, how the master presents him or herself to the dog, the dog immediately recognizes the master or the mistress. Whether the master or the mistress is in a bathrobe, whether they're in a formal dress, whether they're in a t-shirt and a pair of shorts, whether they're in a bathing suit, whether it doesn't matter what the clothing is, the faithful dog will always recognize the master. And so the characteristic of Prahlad, which we need to emulate, we need to learn from Prahlad. We need to become like him in the, uh, in the unviability of his faith and his complete trust in the Lord in all circumstances. How is it that Prahlad can do that? Because no matter how this material world presents itself before us, and even if it presents itself as threateningly as a demon who has conquered the entire universe with all of his hordes and all of his resources, there's no one more expert in killing than Rani Kashipu. There's no one more powerful in killing than Rani Kashipu. Even if one is presented with the threats of death in the form of death personified because one is steeped in devotional service of the Lord, because one is deeply trustful of the Lord, one can see that this is the Lord. Prahlad was looking at Harani Kashipu and seeing this is God. This is the hand of God. He sees that in all forms, in all circumstances, in all dresses, Prahlad and devotees of the caliber of Prahlad can sniff the presence of the Lord in all circumstances. Teshim sadhariyotinam bhajanam didami buddhi yogam tam yenabhanam. And on his part, the long beyond the time when lesser devotees and even demigods lose their faith, the devotee such as Prahlad Maharaj never wavers, never falters, never stumbles, trusting in the Lord, never complaining, never blaming the Lord, but always feeling themselves in the hands of the Lord, protected by the Lord. They see him, they sniff him, so to speak, under all circumstances. And this is what Krishna consciousness is. It's not a change of dress. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a shaven head. It's not a, a clothing style. It's not a hairstyle. It's not a, a culture. It's not, it's not that when we become Krishna conscious, we changed our culture and went from the American culture to the Indian culture. Krishna conscious, it doesn't matter where you're coming from, what ethnicity, what gender, what nationality. It is the process to uplift the consciousness to a state that irrespective of whatever happens in life, we're always happy, we're always fixed because we have the cause of all causes, Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Got some good poetry here. Let's get to it, shall we? As soon as I wet my mouth here. Ah. So starting... From top, Guru Krishna is the first one that jumped on board. Facebook here, John Malik. They both offer me a motivational Monday, Hare Krishna. Brent, who has, sets up a book table every Sunday now at the Spanish Fork Temple. We should do that in Salt Lake City too. Anyone willing? Set up a book table. By Bobby. Joined. Shali, Shirley. Natasha, Pragna, Haribo Pragna, Anjali, says Haribo to the postman, true and by Bobby. Now Brent, we have our first, uh, first versifying here. Brent says in the comment section of Facebook, it's just a lull when the teeth are dull. You notice the pain when the sharp teeth bite again. <laughs> I like that. It's just a lull when the teeth are dull. You'll notice the pain when the sharp teeth bite again. Anjali says, down around, but time to look. 
down around but time to look i know what you're saying another one by brent we can surmise an unwanted uh, no we can surmise an unwise material fix when problems arise but the real solution comes from disillusion with material matter we can surmise an unwise material fix when problems arise but the real solution comes from disillusion with material matter and natasha this is a little longer beware the calm where all seems right smooth seas may hide a daunting fight for strength is forged in trials faced and shadows cast and fears embraced that is really what do you think of that rob that's pretty first class very or, first class G. beware the calm where all seems right smooth seas may hide a daunting fight for strength is forged in trials faced in shadows cast and fears embraced wow that was really good there's something to be said for this AI, huh? Satish Kalyan, something exactly that I wanted to hear today. I'm glad for that, Satish. Chad, Will Wright, Hare Krishna. By Bobby says, how was it that Narada Muni glorified Rani Kashipu? Well, pride comes before a, a fall. So Narada Muni was just a, in Arda Muni, sometimes he he plays up to the demons. He did it with Kamsa also, so that uh, the outcome would be catalyzed. The time frame would be moved up. Now, Narada Muni wanted the Lord to appear as Nisringadev. And so he's he's puffing up Hiranyakashipu's ego so that Hiranyakashipu increases and intensifies his efforts to kill his son, Prahlad, and all the more quickly comes to that point where he crosses the line and the Lord comes as Nishingadev. Narad wants to see Nishingadev ASAP. He's like hankering after that. And so he's like, he's he's priming Hiranyakashipu to commit ever more heinous and heinous atrocities so that the Lord will appear all the more quickly, all the more sooner. <clears throat> Narada Muni is the original psychologist. <laughs> Here's more from Natasha. Prahlad's faith, a beacon bright in the face of evil, a resilient light. For where challenges bloom and shadows fall, courage rises a triumphant call. Man, that's good stuff. Prahlad's faith, a beacon bright in the face of evil, a resilient light. For where challenges bloom and shadows fall, courage rises, a triumphant call. You know, I've tried AI and it just seems a little too pat, a little too smug, a little too trite. But this doesn't. Your your um, poetry, Natasha, with the help of AI, seems original. It seems original and fresh. For Lod's faith, a beacon bright. In the face of evil, a resilient light. For where challenges bloom and shadows fall, Courage rises, a triumphant call. Very good. A Prahlad again, um, Brent again, like Prahlad, be tolerant like a hardwood tree if you want Nishringadev to hear your plea. Yes, like Prahlad, be tolerant like a hardwood tree if you want Nishringadev to hear your plea. Yes. Okay. It comes down to that plea time we all look forward to where rob wraps everything up to you rob Hare Krishna Prabhuji that's some great stuff today yeah yeah from everyone all right material happiness is just less distress mm-hmm if you look down and around, no solution will be found. You must look high to the spiritual sky and humbly rely. Nice. Nice. Even the greatest material power fades like a dying flower. Nothing beats death but God's name with your final breath. Can you read that once again? Even the greatest material power fades like a dying flower. Nothing beats death but God's name with your final breath. Mm -hmm. nice very very poetic 
I like that. I'm a pure to, devotee oh, has. Yeah, sorry, what was that? Um, I'm gonna have to steal some of this stuff for for songs. Please do. You guys don't sing them. I will. A pure devotee has no fear and sees the Lord is always near. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even if you bump and bumble, put yourself in God's hands and stay humble and you will not fumble or stumble. <laughs> you can run full speed, even with a blindfold on. Hare Krishna. Haribo. All right, we'll post those and uh, thank you also everybody, not only for just listening passively, but for actively putting your brains into gear and uh, complementing and expanding our points of philosophy with your own verses, your own vocabulary and your own realizations. This is a group effort, folks. We're in this together. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow. Transcendental Tuesday. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Rama, Hare Hare. We'll wait a few more moments in case you want to put some hearts and some thumbs up there. We can have a little flurry of those as we close. Yes, that one. Don Malik's very active there. Yeah. All right. Until tomorrow. Chant Hare Krishna. <laughs>